All right, friends, good to have you back. I want to welcome you to a live Q&A with my friend Preston Sprinkle, author of Does the Bible Support Same-Sex Marriage? On Monday, we posted an in-depth conversation in which we responded to the main 12 biblical arguments for same-sex marriage and invited questions and comments. There's been over 25,000 views, which is really cool, and well over 300 comments. I've done my best to pick some comments and questions to respond to that are thoughtful, relevant, interesting, uh, repeated comments. Some I couldn't understand. Now, admittedly, uh, I'm going to keep them anonymous instead of mention people because the nature of the subject. And I've rewarded some, hopefully for clarity. Now, the primary focus here is going to be on the Bible and same-sex relationships. There were some questions that were political, historical, parenting. That's another conversation that we could have, Preston, although there's just two or three I might weave in here. That's Mm -hmm. the main focus. So thanks for coming back, my man. You ready to roll? Yeah, thanks for having me on. Yeah, I'm I'm ready ready as I'll ever be. All right, good. Well, this first one is is personal, and I think it's going to maybe help frame the conversation because this is one I paused and I read a few times. Mm -hmm. It said, it is tiring being gay and celibate soul destroying in many ways sometimes i think straight men like sean i'm assuming should think about how they would feel if they woke up tomorrow with no wife or kids were told their attraction to women was unnatural and their only option was to be celibate and likely lonely for the rest of their lives Mm -hmm. what i can tell this person as with a clear conscience as best as i can that is a thought experiment i have done over and over in my mind Mm-hmm. I've read a ton of books from people, in fact, pastors like Ed Shaw and others who have described just moments of being on the kitchen floor in pain and agony. And so endless conversations, just hearing people in their stories. I'm not going to pretend that I fully get it. I think if I woke up and was really there, there would be a level of like, wow, now I get it. So I mm-hmm. always have some hesitancy to say, oh, I totally get it. I understand. But I just want to tell you as best as I can, this is not just academic for me. This is personal. And before the Lord, I've done my best to enter into and hopefully approach this with graciousness and kindness. Do you want to add anything Mm -hmm. to that, Preston, before we jump into the specific questions? I mean, I mean, I'm glad you're leading with this question, Sean, Mm -hmm. because it is so deeply relational, so honestly human. I love the humility and honesty behind Um, the question, I love the, I love the genuine frustration, you know? Um, and and I don't, I'm not in no way. Am I going to say like, Oh, you know, pull yourself up by your bootstraps and you can do it and muscle it out Mm. and just pray more or read the Bible more. Like those, 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 it's almost like, you know, when, when someone loses a child and I have many friends who have lost children, um, to say, well, God has a plan for the, you know, I I, I could Mm. give like a theological response to this. I, I don't, I don't know if that's, really what's needed here. Um, I will say on a practical level and here, all I'm doing is mediating or re relaying, um, what other gay friends of mine who are committed to celibacy have, have told me, um, almost all of them experience levels of profound flourishing and happiness and other, you know, levels, as you said, where they're just weeping because they just feel like this is just like feels like too heavy of a burden to bear to bear and all of the one all of the friends that i'm thinking of have said when i'm experiencing profound in-depth honest non-sexual intimacy especially same-sex non-sexual intimacy that does um it doesn't solve everything it doesn't take away your sexual desires doesn't mean that, you know, oh, everything else is going to be easy. But they say that does sure. have an effect on mm. the level of sexual desires that I have. Not, not, I'm not saying it reduces sexual desire. I'm saying it puts sure. it in this bigger context because sexual desire, sex, a desire for romantic and sexual intimacy is one part of our greater desire for love and intimacy that includes non-sexual, non-romantic intimacy. And they're all sort of related together. Um, that's one thing I'd say. I'd also say, I mean, I, you know, I love you, you kind of, you know, call out Sean, Sean, have you, you know, really considered this or even me, have I considered this? And I, look, I, I want to represent every, I will represent every straight person to say, 
even straight men married to women we have a lot of our own kind of sexual struggles and frustrations and issues mm. i'm not saying that every individual personally but simply being straight and being married to the opposite sex as a straight person that doesn't really take away that doesn't take away all the other temptations and struggles that that that's fair uh, that we have as well so humanity all of us are, are going to go through life and and struggle and and with different things and and that's just man that's um that's just part of the complete the beautiful complexity of living the christian life which has suffering and self-denial built into the very fabric of 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 the way of Christ. And that's just, you know, sometimes that, that feel that does feel unbearable. And I think it's okay to crowd to God and say, this mm. feels un unbearable. Mm. That's what we see in the Psalms for sure. Yeah. All right. Well, thanks for that opening response. By the way, we were joking ahead of time that we're kind of black and white here. This was not planned and people can read into that. <laughs> My black shirt, your white shirt, whatever that means. But uh, yeah. let's, let's have some fun here. Now this one, is a very common one. This is in the top 21 that you address, but we didn't talk about it in our mm -hmm. first conversation. The person says, is there evidence that people are born gay, lesbian? If that were true, why yeah. would God do that to somebody? And are these people supposed to be romantically lonely their whole life? So maybe just the first part, what's the evidence that people are born gay or lesbian? That's a great question. And um, I'm going to stick, because gay and lesbian are identity labels. So I'm going to stick with the more technical phrase, you know, attra uh, same sex attracted, okay. attracted to the same sex. Um, yeah, you know, I, I would say there is uh, one of the only areas where there is largely a consensus among scholars across all kinds of theological and political spectrums in this conversation. Um, there is largely a consensus that that we don't know <laughs> the cause of why somebody is attracted to the same sex. Uh, it's often framed in terms of nature mm. and nurture. Are they born this way? Um, are there, is there something in, in one's upbringing, their environment that, that creates or cultivates an attraction to the same sex? And based on study after study after study after study, um, the, the results show that it's, it's, it's an un it's a complex blend of both in, in, in most cases, and it's hard to even unravel that. Um, in most cases, there does seem to be what some scientists have called, you know, like a biological propensity hmm. that might be nurtured along through some environmental um, situations. But again, it's for every individual that's that's different. Now, I like that this is framed in terms of of theology, not necessarily science. We mm. could talk about science all day, but this question is mm. saying, why would God make somebody this way and then say, it's okay, it's not okay to act on the way I made you. Now, the framing it that way does um, assume, it kind of assumes a lot of things that would need to be unpacked, you know? Yes, it's true, God makes gay people, God makes lesbian people because God makes all people, but Amen. we also, um, that's also, that's all that also intersects with this fact according to christian theology that we are born in a fallen world and that mm -hmm. humans are born with propensities to do all kinds of things that may or may not align with god's will so theologically um we do have to factor in not just god single-handedly creating people but also we are born into a fallen world with fallen a fallen nature and fallen desires now is this one of those fallen desires is acting on a same-sex attraction is that sin or not sin well that's a that's a that's that's another conversation we would need to have, um, which is obviously what the book is about. Um, so, uh, yeah, so I, I would say uh, scientifically uh, a complex blend of nature and nurture. So we can't yep. say that people are simply created by God to be gay. That is both scientifically and theologically. Uh, I would say that's an in, just an inaccurate uh, statement. Um, I, I also would just briefly um, are these people supposed to be romantically uh, lonely their whole life? Um, I would go back to something that a lot of my gay and lesbian friends have told me, you know, I could live without sex, but I can't live without love and intimacy. And until Amen. the church understands the difference, it's kind of hard to live. You know, I don't, I do want to expose um, what was uh, very popular in purity culture that I grew up in that you know, you can't really flourish as a human being unless you have a sexual slash romantic lifelong partner. That was, I don't know if anybody ever, ever said that directly to me, but it was 
very thick in the air of my yep. conservative Christian upbringing that if you're like still single at 30, gosh, whoa, whew, sad for you. You know, mm. I think we our evangelical culture has nurtured a really kind of a warped view of marriage and singleness. And so, um, yeah, I don't think um, marriage is designed by God to be the solution to human loneliness. Uh, the Bible does talk about loneliness. It does talk about how to solve that. And rarely, rarely is marriage like given theologically as the solution. Rather, intimacy within the right. community of brothers and sisters in Christ mm -hmm. is the main thing that solves our loneliness. So I don't want to reduce solving loneliness to everybody, anybody who doesn't get married to the person they're sexually attracted to, they're destined to loneliness. Like I think that is a very secular way of looking at uh, human nature and, and sexuality. That's great. Uh, my friend who I know you know as well, Christopher Yon, written a book, and he said it's not about heterosexuality or homosexuality, but holy sexuality. And he yeah. says, given yeah. the fall, we shouldn't be surprised. It fits that people would have desires that maybe don't line up with God's design for their life in all areas. Mm -hmm. And I think I think he's on to something. All right, so with these questions, listed them out. You and I are going back and forth who started. There's really no rhyme or reason for that, and then the other may give his two cents. Uh, here's a question that says, uh, Christians went from rejecting divorce and remarriage to accepting it in the 70s and 80s when it hit critical mass enough to ignore verses like Luke 16, 18 that seems to condemn divorce and remarriage. Well, the same thing happened with same-sex marriage. Now, this is not technically a biblical question, yeah. and I somewhat hesitate because I'm not a prophet. I don't know what's coming down. In fact, I work at a nonprofit organization just for the record, but I <laughs> will give my two cents on this one. I would actually say, I hope not. Now, hmm. the reason being, because as you and I have discussed, I don't think there is a biblically faithful way to same-sex marriages being within God's design for marriage. So I hmm. hope the church won't adopt it. I'm only speaking for myself, having studied this a ton. I hope not. Hmm. Now, I think about 10 years ago, the conversation was largely between the church and and outside the church. I've seen a few signs I won't go into right now that this is beginning to change and that there are some people who are mainstream evangelical who are wanting to adopt a third way more than in the past. I don't know how far that's going to go, but if I had to guess, I think there will be at least a sign more significant minority of people who are okay with this than right now in the next two to five years. How far that'll go, I don't know. But that would be my best guess if I had to. Yeah, it's a great thought. And uh, in my anecdotal observation, so take it for what it is, you know, it's just anecdotal. It's my personal observation. When, when most evangelical churches shift their view to affirming same-sex marriage, I'm yet to, again, personally, maybe I'm just missing loads of data that would contradict what I'm about to say. Sure. But in most cases that I see, the church largely dwindles in 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 size um we're seeing denominations you know go through this and i don't think it's um it doesn't seem like the affirming view is growing in popularity as we thought it would now i do want to make clear too we are talking about western yes largely agreed. white dominated churches if you agreed. go to where christianity is exploding in growth mainly the global south um we don't see largely uh those churches which again far outweigh population wise the the the, the western um mm. uh, more wealthy or white elite churches um uh the growth has happened in the global south and we don't see a, a trend yeah. towards affirming same-sex marriage That's so i do point. i do want to get our heads above our kind of western you know fair enough microcosm um yeah um and, and divorce i it's this is an interesting you know christians went from rejecting it divorce and remarriage to accepting it i'm gonna i i i'm i'm not gonna say I can agree or disagree with that. Mm. I, the, the Christians I know that have been through a divorce, my mom included, mm. um, they, they say they prof experience a profound stigmatization in the church. Mm. I, I've never met a divorced person who says, when I say I'm divorced, mm. people are like, great, that's awesome. I accept that people are kind of like, like they feel a lot of stigmatization. But again, I'm, I'm just going on anecdotal personal um, observation. So I don't, I don't know if I would necessarily agree that we, the, the church or Christians as a whole, are why you know went to accepting divorce in the 70s and 80s but you know again i could be proven wrong that's, that's not fair. that's not what 
my area is, is on. So. Yeah, the focus might be on remarriage as well. And I think last thing we'll move on mm-hmm. is you're right. We I, I think studies that I've seen have shown is that the church has largely largely held the evangelical church to the historic Christian view. My question is, as millennials and Gen Zers who tend mm-hmm. to have yeah. more affirming views move into leadership, will we see that shift? Remains to be seen, and I think we will likely see some shift. But let's <laughs> let's keep going. Yeah. Here's an interesting one. Uh, this one I'm going to throw your way. I, or, yeah, I think, gosh, are you up? I think this is yours. Yes, you are responding to my question. So here it is. Uh, it says, which biblical marriage? Adam married himself, and I think it meant that Eve came out of Adam. Uh, Cain and Seth married either their sister or their mother. Abraham married his half-sister. Jacob married two sisters and their servants. Moses' father married his aunt, L-O-L. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, I guess I'm not. Uh, it, it's respond. I'm, it's a question. I'm not sure what the what it's. Well, I, I get it. What it's getting at. There's a little unclarity on where they're going. I guess. Um, it again, it's not really an argument for same same sex marriage. It seems to be kind of um, pointing out cracks in you know uh, using the Bible to support you know mm-hmm. male female marriage. I guess I would just. Um, point out that we need to make a firm distinction between the is and the ought. The is is what happened in scripture and well, scripture, all kinds of sinful stuff. I mean, you're just, this question is kind of scratching on the surface. We can go to all kinds of way more horrific stuff I agree. that involves sexual relationships in, in the Bible. Just because it is in the Bible doesn't mean it ought to be followed by mm. humans. In fact, the entire book of Judges is designed to say for everything that's good and holy, please don't do what all these people are doing in the book I of Judges. Agree. So, um, so yeah, it doesn't. Um, w- when we look at, so we need to make a distinction: is is how has the Creator designed us to uh, steward our sexual desires? And I, and I do believe that, um, you know, uh, when we ask the question, "What is marriage?" I think you think sex difference is part of what marriage is. It's why you know I talked about that early in the in the book and it's it's important i guess to put a bow on this um that when jesus you know addresses marriage or other ethical questions he goes back to the original design you know we had that passage in matthew 19 where you know the pharisees uh say hey you know moses permitted divorce you know what do you say about that and jesus says well that was because of the hardness of your heart someone mm. like god god sort of accommodated to your human weakness but then he says but from the beginning, it was not so. Have you not read? That's right. The Creator made the male and female, and, he, and just that the whole ethical direction is going back to God's original design, not simply going to the middle of Scripture where we see humans departing from that design. So, um, yeah. Do you have anything to add? I, I mean, that's. Uh, I, I know uh, that's that's. Uh, yeah, uh, that's. It's interesting. I'd say a couple things. I'd say there's two different questions here. There's one, Adam marrying Eve. Uh, Cain and Seth marrying either sister or mother seems to be this pattern that the scripture sets up. Who else was Adam going to marry? Who else was uh, Cain and Seth going to marry? That seems to be partly what the scripture is saying was according to God's design, whereas Abraham marrying his half-sister, Jacob, Moses' father, of course you could add Solomon and David, is not according to God's design. So the first one is kind of the question of incest, and I just say a couple things. I don't want to get sidetracked with this, but there's two basic responses to this. First off, even Cain and Seth marrying either sister or mother, there's still a sexed component in here, by the way, male, female, that's a part of it. And there's going to be a response to incest, two options. One is actually God created other people outside of Cain and Seth that they went out and married. That raises other theological questions, but the churches rest with that through history. Or God set up a system in which incest was permissible for a season and not condemned until the Mosaic law. Those are the two options. Don't want to go down that rabbit trail, but those are the two ways I can think of out of it. Now, when we get to Abraham, Jacob, Moses, David, and Solomon, now it seems to be they're going against God's created order and God's created design. And that's where I think your distinction, the way I phrase it, is we shouldn't confuse what the Bible describes with what the Bible prescribes. So God allows Jacob to have multiple uh, wives, Mary's sisters, Mm -hmm. but we see the destruction in his life. 
We see it with mm-hmm. Solomon. We see it with David. And I think that's a Bible teaching through narrative that when we step outside of God's design, there's consequences. It's one. I, and what I like about the question is it's it's one of the reasons why I actually don't use the phrase biblical marriage, <laughs> even oh, though I do believe that's the view of marriage that I hold to is taught in Scripture. It's because mm. of this thing. Because some people confuse if, mm. the word biblical with things that are contained inside the Bible, and it's like, well, yeah, that's we just that's not what we need to go on. We need to go back to uh, you know the Creator's original design as revealed through the Bible. And if that's what we mean mm. by biblical marriage, then it's fine. But yeah, I, I, I try to use a better phrase than that. That's great. Okay, so this one, somebody emailed me, by the way. This is the only one I didn't pull directly from the YouTube, but somebody emailed me, okay. uh, someone that I that I know, and we've had a couple conversations about this, told him that I would, I would throw it in the mix. He watched. Really want your thoughts on this, Preston. He says, why mm-hmm. does the apologetic strategy on the subject begin with the therefore of Genesis 2.24, the definition of marriage, not prioritize what the therefore is there for Genesis 2.18? And then he qualified it by saying the historical affirmation of marriage between one man and one woman combined with the biblical sexual act that all sex outside of marriage, this relationship is sin, shuts down the conversation before it even begins. I would say that concern behind this, I don't think we should shut it down. That's why you title your book 21 Conversations. You and I have had public conversations with people and will continue to do so. So we're not trying to shut it down for one. But let me read this in context and again, really want your thoughts on this one. So mm-hmm. two twenty four, this or therefore, you know, is why mm-hmm. a man leaves his father and mother, bonds with his wife, and they shall become one flesh. He says, why does it start with two eighteen? This is then the Lord God said, it's not good for the man to be alone. I will make a helper corresponding to him. So if we go back to two eighteen, the problem is the man is alone and needs someone corresponding to him. That's the root of the problem. I would say that's a piece of it, but we got to look at the entire context of Genesis 1 and 2. Genesis mm-hmm. 1 says God makes them male and female, says multiply and fill the earth, but doesn't tell us how or the mechanism that's going to take place. Genesis mm-hmm. 2, the entire passage, tells us there's the household that's meant to be father and mother, and the man leaves his father and mother, clings with his wife, They become one, have kids, and then their kids leave. Mm -hmm. So the therefore is not just about 218. I think it's even broader than that. Now, Mm -hmm. if we focus down on 218 when it says it's not good that the man should be alone, it it doesn't say that the man was lonely. This is really important. This is not a subjective he was feeling lonely. It's not good that human being lacks another human relationship. We are Mm -hmm. made to love God and love others. So I think a piece of this is saying that we're supposed to be in relationship with humans. We're supposed to be in relationship with God. But Adam just names all the animals. He notices that they're pairs and they have a corresponding male Mm -hmm. and female. And so what this is partly saying is Adam realizes, oh, I don't have a corresponding one, not just another human being but one that Mm -hmm. distinctly corresponds to me, that is like me in Mm -hmm. terms of human, different in terms of female, so I can complete the task that God has called me to multiply and Mm -hmm. fill the earth. That's how I see it. Agree, disagree? No, I I do agree with that, Sean. And and, uh, what's even fascinating is that the word for corresponding to there is is a Hebrew word, kenegdo, it's only used in 218 and 220, um, mm. and it's translated in the same way, suitable partner or whatever, according to certain translations. Well, kenegdo is a, is a compound Hebrew word combining ki, which means as, like, or similar to, and neged, which means opposite of, in front of, standing opposed to each other. Mm-hmm. So it, the author um, cre- almost creates this Hebrew compound word to convey both similarity and difference. Obviously, Excellent. as you pointed out, the similarity is Eve's humanness. What is the difference that me that, that that she brings to the table to be a suitable partner? I don't think it's a stretch to say it's her femaleness, not her personality, or that she's an Enneagram <laughs> seven and he's an eight or something like. Because people say, "Well, no, yeah, differences yeah, are good, I but it doesn't have to be sex difference." And I'm like. Yeah. I okay, I, I I can affirm that, but what is Genesis two getting at? Is it really talking about That's anything right. other than her sex difference? 
And then I think that's affirmed in 223. So with the therefore is actually drawing on 223 where he says, this is bone mm. of my bone, flesh of my flesh. In other words, this is a common human. And then he says the second half of 223, she shall be called woman for she was taken out of man, highlighting her difference. So it's almost like this similarity and difference wrapped up in the Kenig Doe is highlighted again, drawn out further in 223. Similarity, difference, therefore, man shall leave his father and mother be joined to his wife. And the two, two sexually different persons will become one flesh. Jesus in Matthew 19 even draws that further when he says he created the male and female. And then he says, therefore, man shall leave his That's father. Right. You know, he quotes Genesis 2, 24. And then he says, the two will become one flesh. So yeah, it's it does seem to me, and again, I I always want to keep with an open hand. You know, maybe I'm reading scripture wrong. All I'm, all I'm trying to do is show people how I'm getting my views from the text of scripture. It does seem to me that sex, when the Bible talks about this one flesh union beginning in two twenty four Genesis, that sex difference is an essential part of that one flesh union. Hmm. I agree. I think that's well said. So marriage is so much more than sexual difference, but I don't see how you can say it's any less than that. Right. All right, we have 22 questions. There's no way we're getting through all of these, so I'm going to do my best to hit the ones. Uh, th this is I'm interested in your take on this. We might see this one a little bit differently. This is a question that said, why do we identify those that experience same-sex attraction by their sin struggle? Aren't we actually affirming them as that when we call them gay? We don't do that with other sin struggles. For instance, I struggle with gluttony. Your thoughts on that one? First of all... Um there's m massive debates within e evangelical circles about the best language that we should use. And I, at the end of the day, if people can at least appreciate the complexity of language and this discussion, that would be a win for me. Um, when people think this is so simple, black and white, <laughs> um, th then that's what I'm like. I don't know if you really appreciate what we're trying to do. We're trying to match modern English terms to ancient biblical concepts while recognizing that not every single one of our questions is directly answered by scripture. So um, I think um, if I called myself straight, that means I am not simply attracted to my wife and nobody else. It means I'm attracted to females, which is 4 billion people on the planet. It doesn't mean that I look at my wife in a way that I'm sexually attracted to her. And then I look at every other woman and it's basically whether I look at a woman or a man, it's the same thing. There's just no sexual attraction there. That's not what it means to be straight. I don't know a single straight man or woman who would, who would say that. Um, is that now I'm only allowed to act on that attraction with my wife. Does that mean my straightness is a sin struggle yeah what i do with that attraction for sure for sure it's a temptation it's something that i am trying to lay at the feet of feet of christ but simply being straight i don't think is a morally culpable sin now in the same way if somebody said well that kind of sounds like my same-sex attraction now i'm referring to maybe christians who are you know uh, believe in a traditional sexual ethic and they don't think it's okay for them to act on this attraction sure. they're like just because I'm same sex attracted as a general category, that doesn't mean I'm like constantly like lusting after every single person of the same sex that I see in the same way that I wouldn't do sure. that with other males. Hopefully that's 4 billion people. That's a lot of lust, you know? Um, so um, now is it okay for somebody to say they are same sex attracted? Most people are like, yeah, I think that that's okay. Um, now, some people use the term gay as simply a synonym for that phrase, same sex attraction. I, and you, I, and you might be delighted to hear this, Sean. I, I, I don't want to downplay the significance of identity labels. Hmm. So I, 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 you know, I, how we view ourselves and the language we use to view ourselves as a human person, I think that that can influence our view of ourselves and, and how we prioritize certain things and how we, you know, so, um, at the same time, I, I, I want to understand if somebody says they are gay and if all they mean is I am attracted to the same sex, not the opposite sex. And I'm laying that at the feet of Jesus and trying to steward that to the best of my ability. I'm not gonna, I don't know. I, I, I 
I'm not going to say, well, you know, your gayness isn't the essence of who you are. You know, Christ is on the throne of mm. your life. And they're like, I, I'm committed to celibacy because I'm out of allegiance to Jesus. Like, give me a break. I'll, obviously, the term gay that I'm using to myself isn't my ultimate identity. Otherwise, I wouldn't be committed to celibacy. So sure. I, I think we need to give people, especially people who are gay or same-sex attracted, however you want to phrase it, some space to kind of work through some of the language thing without saying, here's the word you must use. Here's the word you must not use. Um, yeah. Do you have okay. any, I would love to hear your thoughts on that. Yeah. Um, yeah. So I, here's the way I look at this. I think people with same sex attraction have often expressed to me as our first question was how hard and difficult and challenging yeah. it is and the sacrifice that they make to follow a biblical sexual ethic when it would be a lot easier emotionally to not do so. So I want to have as much space as I can for those who are within the historic Christian sexual ethic, identifying as gay or not identifying as gay. I ask myself, do I want to die on that hill? And how do I extend as much charity to those as I possibly can? That's a mm -hmm. posture I want to take. Now, when I do hear, an, I wonder if there's a difference here, that people who are often born in the church with same-sex attraction, wrestling it with it, those who are born outside of the church and have a radical conversion to faith tend mm -hmm. to view identifying that label very differently. So yeah. Christopher Yuan would resist that. I think Beckett Cook would resist that. And I hear many of their voices, and this isn't universal, saying that was a part of my past. This, even the fact that we have to qualify, like you had to qualify what we mean by gay, lends itself to confusion that mm -hmm. I think we need to seriously think through the wisdom of doing so. I don't think it's a moral issue. I think mm -hmm. it's a question of wisdom, and I don't think we should rush in and just use the term from our culture without thinking what it communicates, mm -hmm. uh, thinking how it's understood, and thinking how clear maybe it is. Those are the questions I would have. But ultimately, this is more of an in-house conversation yeah. that we just have to use wisdom and show charity how we handle it. Mm -hmm. That's my I sense. do want to I – know, I know we're trying to go – quickly here, but just, I'll try to keep this short. I, I do think, I, I agree with what you're saying, and I think we should be sensitive to the context. For instance, um, I, I have a you know, friend, Greg Coles, you know, Greg is a yeah. Christian who, who says he's gay and he's committed he's to celibacy. Um, and he, he would, I think you agree with everything I'm going to say. If, he, if he's going to preach at like a conservative church, he wouldn't say, hi, my name's Greg and I'm gay. And I'll open up to, you know, um, <laughs> you know, uh, Ephesians four, we're going to, that would just throw people off. Now, Say he's sitting at Starbucks, he's reading his Bible, and somebody mm -hmm. comes up and says, oh, you a Christian? And he's like, yeah, I'm a Christian. I'm actually a pastor. And the guy says, oh, well, I'm gay, so obviously I can't become a Christian. If Greg says, oh, well, I struggle with the sin of same-sex attraction too, that's not going to communicate as powerful, as missionally, as if he said, oh, I'm, I'm gay too, and, and I'm a pastor. Because this guy has an understanding that simply being attracted yeah. to the same sex is a barrier. You cannot be attracted to the same sex and be loved by Jesus. I think that's theologically pro problematic. Mm. And I think missionally in that kind of scenario, especially with the younger generation, the term gay is actually more missionally beneficial to communicate, to deconstruct that false barrier that this person has between him and the creator. So I, I really think can, we do need to ask the question, not are these terms good or bad, but what context are the wisest maybe to use this over a, a different term, um, but it's That's complex fair. and there's good people well, on all sides of this debate, you know, I think it's fair to, to leave it at that. Now here's an interesting one. It says, consider this. What if we have entered a new dispensation where God is changing the focus of marriage? Israel had strict purity laws for food and clothing, but that all changed in the book of Acts so that Gentiles would be welcome. We are now at a point in history where the earth has been replenished, so God's new dispensation towards marriage focuses on the aspects of love and also of orphan care, which same-sex couples could do. Here's my response, and it's going to be a lot more simple. The phrase okay. is, what if? And I go, oh, okay, so this is an interesting thought experiment. What if? This is a possibility. I'm not interested in possibilities. My friend Jay Warner Wallace, a cold case detective, said in a court of law, you can't say, well, this is possible. You have to show what is probable. So, yeah, mm -hmm. that's possible. But when new dispensations come in, there's often miracles, clear 
teachings and supernatural words that come in. And I am not seeing that in the case here. Mm -hmm. So open to it. I can see it. It's possible, but not persuaded that the case has been made that we are in fact in a new dispensation and God has spoken directly in a unique way. Yeah. Yeah. I I would agree with all that. And I have a whole chapter that addresses this, uh, this argument. It does come up quite frequently. Um, I would say that uh, we are in a, you could say, new dispensation, new covenant, and this new covenant has some similarities to the old covenant, has some differences to the old covenant. One of the differences is, yeah, some of the purity laws, food, clothing, uh, those are different between old and new covenants. Other things are the same. Um, Adultery is outlawed in both covenants. Uh, Loving Mm, your neighbor actually is straight out of Leviticus 19. And so there's a lot of similarities and differences. The question is when it comes to sex difference in marriage, And related to this conversation, same-sex sexual relationships, do we have any biblical evidence that this new dispensation, this new covenant has changed those specific um, obligations for followers of God? And the answer not only is no, but in the book of Acts, in the very passage, Acts 15, that we read about the apostles saying, no longer are these food laws and circumcision demanded for Gentiles. They do turn around and say, but here are some things that is demanded of Gentiles. Namely, one of them is that they should abstain from sexual immorality. And the Greek word porneia, Porneia, sexual immorality, would include uh, all sex outside of male-female marriage. So uh, we just don't, we can't say that because we see some differences in in this question, food laws, therefore, let's map all that on whatever ethical question we want to do. So side note, this also came up. Acts 15 says, uh, even though we have the new covenant, this continues on porneia, but it also says what abstain from blood and animals mm-hmm. strangled. Would you still say those then apply today? Um, I would say there, first of all, there's a lot of unclarity about what they even mean by blood. One interpretation is that it's a synonym, it's a shorthand for murder. Another one is oh. eating animal blood. Yeah, there, there's, it's, it's just, it's a little bit of a compact phrase that, that doesn't have a lot of clarity. So I would say we need to understand kind of what that word even means. Um, and strang- animals strangled, we do have to understand kind of like what, um, like why there, there's like, w- what is it about that act that um, is, is not, um, is not good. Are there any modern parallels to that? I don't think we strangle animals today when we kill them. Do we? I don't know. I'm not a butcher, but, um, mm-hmm. but I would say, yeah, if, if once we understand what these terms mean in the original context, okay. then I would say, yeah, we should abide by what the Bible says. So fair enough. Here's hopefully a quick one for you. Uh, how confident are you both that you have this theologically correct, you, that you are right on this topic? How yeah. confident are you, Preston, that you got this right? Well, I, I I'm certainly not 100% confident because I'm not 100% confident I'll be a Christian tomorrow. I mean, I don't, <laughs> I, <laughs> I, 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 I hold all of my views. I try to hold all my views with um, a degree of humility and honesty. All I can say is based on my um, best, most researched interpretation of scripture. Well, first of all, I come at this with obviously, you know, obviously presupposition that I believe scripture is god's the creator god's revelation for how humans are to live in all times and places um so based on my best understanding of what that what the creator has said through scripture this is where i'm at and i have many reasons why i believe marriage is uh between two sexually different persons if i encounter a um it'd probably need a series of arguments that would show why I'm misunderstanding scripture, then I would change my view. I'm going to go where the text leads. That's fair. Um, I have read pretty much everything on the topic, wrestled with every counter argument that I, and I've been doing this for a, a while. So I, I, I would just to be honest, I think that is a, a more unlikely scenario. Um, but yeah, I always want to hold my views I, with an open hand. I'm a sinful human being and my mm. interpretation is uh, clouded by my f- f- fragile humanness. But I mean, I would say that about orphan care or that racism is wrong or that feeding the poor is a good virtue. Like any, anything, I, any value I hold to, it, I'm basing it on my best reading of scripture at this moment. That's fair. I would say levels of confidence, uh, it's not black or white. There's, if you had like certain, near certain, very confident, slightly confident, undecided. 
I'd say yeah. I'm somewhere around very confident. Yeah. And this is probably hundreds and hundreds of hours of reading dozens and dozens of books, watching endless YouTube videos, conversations. And I feel like I've done my homework. There's always more to learn, but I have just mm -hmm. spent almost as much time on broader issues of sexuality as I have on probably any topic, including the resurrection that I teach. So, Trinity and yeah. <laughs> yeah, actually yeah. more than I have theologically studying yeah, the no, Trinity, if I'm going to be honest. <laughs> so I'm very confident, not certain. Yeah. I always, as I get new books, I go, I try to train myself to say, okay, what are you stream made? Am I missing something? How do I approach this? That's the, uh, the mm -hmm. approach I try to take, but I just say I'm, I'm very confident. All right. I think we answered that one. Here's, I guess this is a little bit more of a practical one. Maybe we can move somewhat more quickly through some of these, but this is what's a biblical response when someone asks what a same-sex married couple should do, especially one with kids. Now, here's what I would say. I, I hesitate to just give a total blanket response because there's very different settings and circumstances and ages of kids and relationships. This is where pastoral ministry and guidance is going to need to come in and help this couple through this. Sometimes the past polygamous couples, when, when, or when, when, like, uh, missionaries would come into a country and see polygamy because it would mm -hmm. affect the kids. They would allow it to continue and then try to root it out in future generations because mm -hmm. of the protection for women and for kids. So there might be situations where that kind of just similar pastoral care is necessary. I don't know. But as a whole, I think the Bible's very clear that sexual activity is reserved for a man and woman in marriage. So a same-sex couple can get a marriage certificate, but mm -hmm. it's not marriage. So mm -hmm. God would desire at least minimally that I think calling it a marriage and any sexual activity stop. I think that mm -hmm. we, can, we can rest our hats on from my perspective and move towards that, whatever practically that looks like. You have thoughts you want to add? Yeah. I, I would agree with all that. I, I think uh, number one, when I, I get this question comes up almost every time I, I give a talk oh, on the topic. Mm -hmm. And my response, it's a little cheeky, but it's trying to drive home the point. My my response is, well, what are their names? Mm. You know, like just just to emphasize mm -hmm. the point you're you're making. Like this is mm. I don't these thirty thousand foot categorical. Like this is a mm. this this requires a a a a, a, a nuanced pastoral response that is in relationship with people that that knows their stories you know they they, they come to, they come to christ okay uh or that wait oh that doesn't even say this but i'm assuming they're saying like if they ha if they both come to christ because if they don't come to christ and i'm like well we'll we'll wait until they are actually oh. following jesus to put, say you need to do what jesus said um so, and even that, so if they're like, well, they became, they Good both became a Christian, uh, they, if they both became a Christian, then that means they, they, they had a radical disruptive encounter with the risen Lord of the universe, who, according to their new beliefs, walked out of a grave they've never seen 2000 years ago. And they said they want to live their entire life under the Lordship of that resurrected Messiah, who is the creator and Lord of the universe. That's what coming to Christ means. Okay. Mm. So if that foundation is there, kind of everything else is, is a, that's a little, I don't say it's easy at all, but I'm saying, right. let's make sure that foundation, that's, that's what we're talking about. I've seen churches take two general responses. One is the one you, you laid out that, um, marriage is by definition between a man and a woman, all sexual activity belongs within that you have kids involved. So these two, this couple should still raise their kids, but they should, abstain from sexual immorality, just like we're all called to do. Again, that might look slightly different, you know, um, according to each different situation. I've, I've had other churches that say, well, if a couple was divorced and remarried and that wasn't biblical, but then they came to Christ and they had kids or whatever, we wouldn't ask them to divorce again. We would accommodate to previous, what we would consider sinful decisions. I, I have some theological, I mean, I think pastorally, I, I appreciate the the complexity mm. there i think 
the analogy isn't perfect and and i think theologically it's a little weaker but i you know i, I do appreciate when pastors are truly trying to wrestle with the, the complexity of real life while trying to maintain theological fidelity good good stuff that that's fair here's a couple maybe quick ones uh, uh let me see here boom, boom, boom. okay here's one it says very sincerely and respectfully why does this even matter if two adults choose to commit to each other and pursue a godly life together, meaning love God and love other people, how is that immoral? I hear you about scripture condemning same-sex behavior, but I struggle to find the relevance. My quick answer is, this starts by saying, first off, I, preach the res I appreciate the respect and sincerity this was asked in. Uh, if two adults choose to commit to each other and pursue a godly life together, meaning love God and love other people, how is that immoral? That's the question that's on the table. What does it mean to love God? What does it mean to love other people? What is marriage? This is the question that has to be answered first. So if you say, well, I'm just going to get in a relationship with somebody of the same sex and I'm going to live a godly life and love them, that is begging the question and assuming that that is a God-honoring relationship that Scripture sanctions. Mm -hmm. So... I would just say I love the desire, and I think we have common ground to live a godly life, but we first have to answer what that looks like. And you and I are Christians, so we are appealing to Scripture to do so and right. don't see the scriptural support that a same-sex sexual relationship would qualify as the kind of loving God and loving your neighbor that God designed us for. Yeah, good. I don't know how much to... I think that's great. And okay. I guess, please, please excuse my terseness. I'm not, you know, there's a lot no, kind of that's great. stuff I could say, but I would just say, I mean, to reaffirm what you said, Jesus said in John, if you love me, you'll do what I say. Like obedience to the creator is correlated with loving the creator. And the Bible itself never treats issues of sexual immorality as some insignificant that's thing. Right. This is a significant part of what it means to follow Jesus. So the question is, is same-sex sexual relationships or all sexual relationships outside of male-female marriage, are they sexually immoral? So that we would need to go back to that kind of theological um, question. But we can't say if people say they love God and love people, then however they steward their sexuality, it doesn't matter. Like that's just not a scriptural or Christian way of thinking ethically. Fair enough. Now this one I think was asked from somebody who's not affirming. And it says, if two same-sex adults wishing to fulfill their heart's desire uh, and marriage were to be brothers from the same parents, would that be affirmed? Now, I think as best I can tell that what this person is saying is if we take the argument that says the Bible was referring to a certain kind of abusive or power imbalance, and it's not referring to the monogamous, mutual, loving, same-sex relationships we see today. If that is your argument— then why wouldn't that also apply to incestual relationships, logically speaking? Because you could say, well, the Bible's not talking about the kind of mutual, loving, uh, caring, monogamous, incestual relationships we are seeing today. Now, before you jump in and give your two cents, uh, I'm going to go out on a limb and say pretty obviously most people who support same-sex marriage aren't going to say, oh, of course we support incest. So that is not the point. It's yeah. a logical inference I think the person is making. And I asked this question to Colby Martin when he was on my show. He's affirming. I said, I just want to know scripturally on what basis, if this is your argument, how you would not also allow incestual relationships. And then the point being, if your reasoning uh, justifies incestual relationships, then maybe there's something wrong with your reasoning and justification in the first place. I think yeah. that's what this person is getting at. Add yeah. thoughts. I would, yeah, not not much to add. I would agree okay. with that. I, I want to make sure we're not, and, and a, well, obviously, I should say obviously, because I get accused of this. When you when we do these analogies, we're 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 testing a component of the logical reasoning, yes. not comparing two different actions. I wrote a blog exactly. years ago drawing out this same point, and it 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 offended. Um, some gay people, mm. and I and I and I actually said I'm, I apologize because there has been a history of of Christians comparing same sex relationships to, for instance, like bestiality or pedophilia or incest, and and that's not helpful. Um, so, but yeah, I think if 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 we're going to determine whether a relationship is 
ethical or not based on whether it's consensual and loving then that if that's the criteria then incest polyamory and other relationships should also be mm. affirmed so i think it is a i think it's a valid logical test case thank you for clarifying that i think that's great okay let's go on this one uh this says does a loveless heterosexual marriage better fit the biblical definition of marriage than a loving homosexual marriage now here's my two cents on this one I would say a loveless heterosexual marriage fits the biblical definition of marriage. Love, loving somebody is neither necessary nor sufficient for, for being married to that person. You can love mm -hmm. somebody, not be married to that person. You can be married to somebody and not love that person. So it's not necessary for the definition of marriage. Now, are there biblical commands to in fact love your spouse. Yeah, husbands love your wives. Mm -hmm. So if you're in a loveless heterosexual marriage, you are in a marriage and failing to live out the kind of love your spouse deserves according mm -hmm. to scripture. Now when it says mm -hmm. compared to a loving homosexual marriage, mm -hmm. the first thing I would say, and I saw a comment earlier that made a comment about how gays are not faithful to each other. And I thought that is completely just such a stereotype and unfair. Yeah. I know a lot of people who are opposite sex who aren't faithful to each other. Yeah. And I know some distinct gay people who have been faithful to each other for a long time. So it's not fair to just make those generalized statements. But say, say you had a loving homosexual marriage, I would push back and I'd say, since we're talking about the definition of marriage, mm -hmm. it's not marriage. Right. Marriage requires sex difference. And I could make my case outside of the Bible for this, and I do in a whole separate book, mm -hmm. but we're talking about biblically here. I don't mm -hmm. see precedent for that actually no. being marriage. What do you think? I got no, I have nothing to add, but, but you, okay. yeah, I think you covered it. <laughs> okay, fair enough. That was quick. All right, let's go on to this one. Uh, this one will start with you before I give my, my thoughts on this at all. Uh, let me see here. This okay. Somebody asked this question. This is somewhat of an easier one. This is why is it that pastors don't think they are equipped to handle the issues themselves? Why is it necessary to outsource the matter to so-called experts like Sprinkle? And I throw myself in there. Your thoughts? I I can't answer this because I don't know which pastors they're talking about. I'm I'm kind of re trying to respond, being asked to respond to a kind of vague notion of pastors, and I don't. I would okay. I would need to know which pastor doesn't think they're equipped to handle and why mm. they, yeah, I don't, I don't. Okay. Honestly, I just don't find the question very interesting. So yeah, okay. you can take I, it. If... So here, here's what I would say. I'd say these are really sophisticated objections that you deal with in your book. And the first mm. time I went to the, uh, the Reformation Project conference a decade ago, heard from Brownson and from some other scholars there, I was like, wow, I need to really study and think about this. I This is my job. I teach classes on biblical sexuality. I write books on it. Past, many pastors just don't have the time to commit to this issue no. and every other issue. So I have so much compassion for pastors who are supposed right. to be experts on everything. So all we're trying to do is put in the time and the work to be a resource to people that's it. It's not that they need to. It's just that hopefully we're helping. That's my quick response. That's okay. So um, let me, yeah, yeah. I, I, I do think that um, discipleship in the church is a communal effort. And I don't think, I don't think it's sound biblical ecclesiology to put all of the um, burden on, you know, senior or just pastors necessarily. Like there are teachers and prophets and other gifts in the, in the church, you know, um, Ideally, yeah, I think pastors should be equipped to handle this issue, but they should also be equipped to handle questions around racism and climate change and, and feeding the poor and discipling yeah. the people and divorce and remarriage. You can't get kind of overwhelming. I think God has created the church as a communal entity so that, you know, some people help out mm. others. And so, um, 
Yeah, I would love for pastors to be able to totally give a thorough response to the meaning of our Sanakotes and Malakoi and Basar Ahred in Genesis 2.24 and be able to interact with the counterinterpretations of that and understand Seneca's view on, you know, uh, what unnatural relations are and how that relates to Paul's Greco-Roman background. Like all those, yeah, I would love for pastors to read Seneca and <laughs> Philo and others to understand. At the end of the day, that that's just, um, I think it's 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 healthy for the church to have some people to be kind mm. of released to do Bible translation, to do textual theory, to do scholarly work like this. So, yeah. Good stuff. By the way, I see a comment here that says, is this a salvation issue? You and I talked about this in the original video. Mm. Is this an issue we can just agree to disagree on and wade into that? So I'm seeing a lot of questions pop up that we dealt with in the okay. original video or in your book. Okay. Uh, go there for them. Okay. I'm curious how you're going to make sense of this one. This is an interesting question. It says, kind of a longer one, it says, Jesus is returning for his bride, which consists of both men and women. Is Jesus breaking the created order by being wedded to men? I'm not suggesting that Jesus is going to have sexual relations with his bride. I'm only demonstrating that marriage in its truest sense is about intimacy and relationship, and biological compatibility for sex may not be God's priority. Although God may have originally created marriage for man and woman, he might be more flexible than you are giving him credit for your thoughts yeah it's an interesting mind experience kind of like the other you know what if um uh a couple of things i would say before we even address it i would i would bring us back to the most fundamental series of three questions what okay. is marriage okay um is uh or no how do you define marriage like the word marriage if you had somebody from a foreign country that, that heard the word marriage and they said, oh, I'm not familiar with that term. What does that mean? Like, how would you explain what that word by definition means to people? So what's your definition of marriage? Um, where did you get that definition from? And how does scripture inform your definition? What is marriage? Or more specifically, is sex difference part of what marriage is? Good. And what does the text of scripture say about that? So that's kind of my starting point before I even entertain all these other good question this is a great question it's a great you know but i would say it's not a good starting question we need to first begin with what is sex difference an essential part of what marriage is or is it not an essential part mm -hmm. um i i think he kind of pointed out he or she pointed out i mean a helpful thing here is saying i'm not saying jesus is gonna have sexual relations with his bride that's kind of where i was right, gonna go saying, right the, the human marriage and divine marriage to humanity, that analogy isn't a one-to-one -one correlation. It's trying exactly. to compare important theological pieces, but it's not mapping one completely on the other. And the fact that God isn't going to have sex with us is one very se mm. significant um, difference between human marriage and how it points to divine marriage. So I don't, um, I guess the last, you know, although God may have originally created marriage for man and woman, he might be more flexible than you are giving him credit for. I would say uh, that's theoretically true. Um, I would say on what basis can we say God is changing his definition of marriage? Because Great. Jesus, not only is it, we're talking about Genesis 1 and 2, we're talking about Jesus and the New Testament affirming the Genesis 1 and 2 design for marriage. So if God has changed his view on marriage, then I think it's a little lame that he didn't tell us about that in Scripture. Um, <laughs> I mean, really, I, so I don't, uh, is it theoretically possible? Well, I guess theoretically, but I would need to see some concrete evidence for mm. that. And I just don't see that in the, in the New Testament. Again, if somebody else says, no, here is where in the New Testament where God has opened up marriage to include sex, same-sex partners, then, sh then let's wrestle with that, that text. That's great. I really appreciate that. I highlighted the bottom where it says he might be more flexible. And again, I'm like, okay, it's possible. That's yeah. interesting. Give me the evidence that, in fact, he is more flexible in yeah. light of how Scripture is, I would argue, very clear on this. I'm going to bring one question really fast, get my two cents, and and move on. Uh, I, I kind of love this. Uh, Travis Statham, Statham says, what should atheists take away from this conversation? And I just say, if you're an atheist and you're watching this, I'm just honored that you're watching this. You might think we're nuts. I'm not going to tell you what you should take away from this conversation. Yesterday, I had a live Q&A with J.P. Moreland and William Lane Craig, and an atheist sent me in-depth response, and it was so 
interesting and fascinating. So I'm curious what you think seeing two Christian men approach this in a certain way with a different worldview. If you're an atheist, tell us, either put comments or send notes somewhere through my website. I'd love to hear what you think. I think the bottom line is it's just two Christians who think the Bible genuinely is the Word of God. And by following the Word of God, we actually flourish as human beings. And this is what is best for relationships with people and ultimately best larger for society. So we are trying to learn what it means to best love our neighbor, and we think God has spoken through Scripture. Yeah. That's my quick I thing. I mean, every religion, I would say, obviously has a sexual ethic and a reason for that sexual That's ethic. That's right. Every atheist has a sexual ethic and a reason for that sexual ethic. So I would say an atheist tuning into this conversation should be almost exactly the same as if I tuned into two atheists talking about their mm. sexual ethic, why they draw the boundaries here, why not here, can poly is polyamory okay or not? Is uh, why is uh, abuse not okay? Is is pedophilia okay or not? Like I would I would be really curious actually about how are you determining your sexual ethic? Is there are there any boundaries? If so, why these boundaries and not these boundaries? Like I would be genuinely curious at mm. how they form that. So I would hope that an atheist would be again learn something about how Christians are wrestling with how their religion has determined um you know their sexual boundaries good stuff love it i think we've got four left i think we can knock this out before we're done at quarter after uh let me read this one it says there are few biblical verses that address homosexuality at all and most of these are not directed at homosexuality per se i'm just reading it as it is opponents of same-sex marriage routinely cite seven verses in the christian bible as condemning homosexuality and calling it a sin but when taken in context these lessons speak not against homosexuality itself, but rather against rape, child molestation, bestiality, other practices that hurt others and comprise a person's relationship with God. Okay, so first thing I would say is this is not the methodology you and I are taking. We haven't mm -hmm. talked about Leviticus 18. We haven't gone to Sodom and Gomorrah. We haven't mm -hmm. gone to Romans chapter 1 except in some reference. The, the basic question we're asking is what is marriage? The Bible begins right. with a marriage. It's in the Ten Commandments. It's all through the Old Testament. Jesus talks about it. Paul talks about it. We're talking about marriage and a broader sexual ethic. So mm -hmm. I don't think it's just six verses. I think that's a mistaken way. They're often called the clobber passages. Mm -hmm. That is just simply not the methodology that we are taking. With that said, I would say... Uh, this person says, these are taken in context, they speak not against homosexuality, and let's just say referring to same-sex sexual behavior, but mm -hmm. rape, child molestation, bestiality, and other practices that hurt others. Well, I would say rape, child molestation, and bestiality are clearly condemned in Scripture. Let me just state the obvious. But these passages are not about that. Matthew mm -hmm. 19 is about the nature of marriage, and Jesus makes it clear pointing back to creation, that it's a sexed institution. Romans 1 talks about our design and our function, and even Paul points again towards creation again, I think pointing back to the garden, and both are held accountable. Uh, so it's not mm -hmm. just one using power over the other. There's account for both. And even though this raises mm -hmm. other questions in Leviticus 18, when you see Leviticus 20, both are held account. That would not be mm -hmm. true if it was just rape, not true if it was child molestation, not true if it was bestiality. Yeah. So I think this objection misses the strategy that we're taking that you and I think for what it's worth is a more biblical approach. Yeah. But even the objection to those passages doesn't work. It is condemning both parties. So there's some level of mutuality going on. Yeah. I'm not much to add. I think that's okay. totally correct. And I would say... Yeah, the, the question itself presumes things that are just factually untrue that might make somebody mad who wrote the argument or wrote the question. But I mean, that, that's what my book is about, is addressing these kind of things. They're, you know, the, um, assuming things about the context of these prohibitions that I point out that are just incorrect. Um, and yeah, the, 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 the reason why the Bible's, uh, the, the book is titled, Does the Bible Support Same-Sex Marriage? It really is a book on marriage, not simply Exactly. specifically these prohibitions against same-sex sexual behavior, although I do address those passages. You do. You incorporate them in the larger case of what is marriage yeah. because they play a part in them, but that's not yeah. all the Bible says that's relevant to the topic of homosexuality. 
Okay. Right. Uh, let me throw this one your way. Give me your thoughts first. It says the Bible never mentions or condemns the concept we call same-sex marriage. Although opponents of same-sex marriage claim that lesbian, gay, bisexual, or transgender unions violate biblical principles, no verses in the Bible explicitly address gay marriage or committed same-sex relationships. Um, yeah, this is another one. I almost want to say, please, I mean, I'm not... I. Yeah, go read the book because I mean it's assuming so many things that I don't think are are okay. correct to assume. Okay. I will say this: the Bible, when it talks about marriage, it uses the phrase "one flesh union," and when it does talk about that, both in the creation account and in Jesus's affirmation of the creation account, so both Old Testament and New Testament, it does define marriage as a union between two biologically, sexually different persons. Um, so I don't, I think that kind of answers or undercuts the claims kind of built into this. It doesn't address same-sex marriage because it doesn't think same-sex marriage is a thing. Um, same-sex sexual unions mm. can be a thing for sure. Um, and it does address those, but it does that the Bible wouldn't record the, the, the Jewish slash Christian authors of the old new testaments wouldn't recognize a same-sex union as a marriage. Um, and that's something I try to point out in the book. Mm. I, that's fair. I think I would say when it says the Bible never mentions or condemns the concept we call same-sex marriage, is our ethic that everything is therefore permissible, the Bible doesn't directly condemn. Mm -hmm. And I think the answer to that has to be clearly no. We could think of a lot of things in the past and in the present that the Bible doesn't condemn explicitly, but the moral principles within the Bible tell us these things are wrong. So yeah. I just think that whole methodology to saying if it's, mm -hmm. you know, it's kind of innocent until proven guilty, I'm like, okay, in this case, you actually have to make a case for this. And it can't mm -hmm. assume that the lack of condemnation therefore means approval just doesn't mm -hmm. logically follow. I do yeah. think it's interesting. It says the Bible doesn't condemn the concept we call same-sex marriage, but then people flip around and also kind of make the argument on the other side that... You know, it's kind of guilty because it doesn't mention it in this case. Uh, it doesn't mention mm -hmm. it, therefore it's fine. The other argument is, well, the Scripture is talking about, it's not talking about the kind of relationships that we have today that are mutual. And I think, wait a minute, it's damned if you do, damned if you don't. It's kind of arguing both sides. It doesn't mention it, mm -hmm. therefore it's okay. It doesn't mention it, therefore, you know, it's not. Like, I just think you can't have it both ways. You can't yeah. make both arguments. And the, the um, Bible does explicitly address committed same-sex relationships. So yeah, sufficiently. Wh while sufficiently, yeah, yeah. Um, but but me, but even that, I, I even even me responding to that, I just want to point out that 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 still even that is kind of a more of a subsidiary point. The main point is this thing called marriage. What is it? And is sex difference part of what marriage is? And do we have clarity in Scripture and how God has revealed what marriage is? So that I just constantly want to bring us back. We need to. And give us a, a robust answer to that question. Is sex difference an essential part of what marriage is? And does scripture say that? And then all these other questions can be addressed from that foundation. Hmm. Great. I appreciate the call back to that. All right. Last question. Then there's kind of a quick one at the end that I think will be easy. And this is literally all it said. It said, do you wear two different kinds of cloth at the same time? Do you allow women to speak in church and walk with their hair uncovered? And I think this person is saying, if we're going to use the Bible as a source to condemn same-sex marriage, but what about passages that condemn not wearing the same kind of cloth? Then presumably you and I might do that or allow women to speak in church. Again, that would be from the Levitical law, the first one, the latter one from 1 Corinthians. And so since we do allow women to speak in church— and we do have different kinds of cloth at the same time. Therefore, we shouldn't be so inconsistent and therefore mm -hmm. condemn same-sex marriage. Now, on one hand, if you and I did actually wear different kinds of cloth and allow women to speak in church, maybe we're just hypocrites. That wouldn't in mm -hmm. itself prove anything other than you and I would actually not be leaving out what we're claiming. It wouldn't make it justifiable. But I think there's yeah. a better response we want to make that has to do with the context I'll let you run with this one. Yeah. Um, yeah, here, I mean, it's, we need to go back to kind of, I guess, kind of more general principles on how to interpret the Bible. You know, we are dealing with Old Covenant, New Covenant. Um, 
some things are permitted in the old and prohibited in the new, and some things are vice versa, you know, permitted in the old and prohibited in the new, they get that right. So um, yeah, there's under the old covenant, uh, there were certain laws, lots of laws um, that Christians don't follow today because we are under a new covenant. Um, and that's, I don't think that's, that's not like, that's not a radical statement. I don't know any very few biblical scholars who would not make a distinction between old covenant law and new covenant law. Sure. Now in both covenants, we have, again, I'll say it one more time, you know, sex difference is part of what marriage is, both under the new covenant and old covenant, because that goes back to the creational design. Um, and we have a, a, a sexual ethic that says all sex belongs within the covenant of marriage, meaning male, female uh, marriage. So just because new covenant Christians might not obey certain specifically old covenant commands, I don't think that that exposes some kind of hypocrisy. Um, mm. Christians aren't Jews. Like that's not a radical thing to say. We have a new, we have a new Testament. Um, now, you know, the, there are certain cultural things, you know, the head covering. Well, he, uh, oh yeah. Head, head coverings. Um, that, that, that passage is so complicated that it's almost hard. It's, we're, scholars aren't even agreed that it's even talking about hair uncovered. Some people say it's talking about long hair or certain hairstyles mm. that conveyed sexual promiscuity in the first century that don't convey the same thing today. So, I mean, that's almost just kind of quickly referencing first Corinthians 11 here is almost like, well, that that's a, that's a three hour long discussion to figure out what that passage is even talking about before we say, should we do that or not, not do that. Good response. I think in the Old Testament, we know a passage is still relevant if it's rooted in creation. And I would also argue in Leviticus 18, no other nations were judged for wearing two kinds of cloth, but they were judged for sexual immorality. So that tells me even these commands go beyond just Israel. Mm -hmm. uh, when it comes to the New Testament passage, we don't move from difficult passages to clear ones. We move from clear passages to difficult ones. And the Bible is clear on what marriage is. How exactly it makes sense of that passage in 1 Corinthians, I would admit that it's difficult and there's some debate about that. That's a reality. But it doesn't fall that there's not clarity about what marriage is. And I think that's where you and I agree. Now, the last one, which is a perfect setup, somebody said, what is the best book on the historic Christian view of marriage? And what is the best affirming book? I'll give my two cents. You give yours. I think the best affirming book is by James Brownson. I wrote a blog, it's probably been three or four years ago, where I wrote, what are the best, I think I maybe said revisionist books, yeah. and I listed out four to five that I thought were the best at the time. I haven't updated it. Uh, so tell mm. me before we go to positive ones, your best affirming book. I would, I would say the same thing, James Brownson. Oh, I, I like okay. it because it's, it's, it's scholarly, thoughtful, and as a scholar, like I, I appreciate the depth of scholarship going into there. I've written two peer-reviewed uh, critiques of the book. So, you know, uh, obviously I, I disagree with it and I've stated publicly why, but, uh, yeah, it's, it's, it's very, um, it's a very thoughtful, well-researched book. I also, I think Karen Keene's, what's it called? Scripture, the possibility, scripture ethics and the possibility of same sex yeah. marriage has an interesting hermeneutical approach to this. We, you and I have gone you know back and forth and shown why we dis obviously we disagree. Otherwise we'd be affirming. So I don't need to keep saying yeah. that, but, um, uh, Matthew Vines, you know, I, I, he has done a, I think a good job of sort of co correlate, correlating, uh, compiling kind of the scholarly discussion and put it in a more popular yes, level. Yes, he has. To me, that's all, that's the most helpful thing in the book, but also the mm. most like the, the, my biggest critiques, I feel like in doing, you know, he's admittedly, he's not like a scholar. He's just kind of reading the scholarly literature. And I think yeah. sometimes he misses things in that, but I always appreciate when people, are well versed in the scholarly literature and, and try to present it in a more understandable way. And that's his book, God and the Gay Christian. That's now yes, I think been out about a decade or so. Yeah. As far yeah. as positive books, uh, there's two that I now recommend. One <laughs> being Darren Belusick's book, Marriage yeah. Scripture in the Church. I had him on. We did a three hour walk through his book, did a live mm. Q and A. So if this was helpful, check that out. I think his book is fantastic. Mm. And uh, your book. Does the Bible support same-sex marriage, which is even newer? I think his is maybe a year or two old. This one came out. Those are the two. That's why I had you on that I think are the best on this topic. Those are the ones I would recommend. So you don't have to answer that question. 
Uh, I will answer <laughs> for you. I think if, if if I had one book to give, I would say Darren's goes into more depth and is more intermediate yeah. level. I think yours is yeah. more of a popular level. So start yeah. with your book and then follow up with Darren's if you want one that goes beyond that. I will plead the fifth on my own book. Um, <laughs> Fair enough. <laughs> I'll let the audience see that, but I will affirm that uh, Darren's book is absolutely incredible. In fact, I, um, in reading his book, I think I endorsed it actually. Um, oh, I think you did. Yeah. I was like, I was like, man, this is an absolutely fantastic scholarly treatment. And I remember thinking, oh, I wish somebody who wasn't a scholar or, you know, might get lost in some of the scholarship yeah. could have access to the arguments that he's kind of wrestling with. So in some ways, I hope that my, my book is really in, I was saying, I don't, I didn't see anything. I really disagreed in Darren's book. I, I think mine is a, maybe a yeah, more me too. popular level kind of response to a lot of the I, same questions. I've got your endorsement here. It says, this is the best book until mine comes out. So no, you didn't write that. <laughs> Just kidding. You would never write that. Had to throw that in there. Uh, they're both excellent <laughs> books. I hope viewers, wherever you stand on this issue, read both of those. Now, hang on one minute afterwards. I got a quick question for you. But those of you who've been tracking this, let us know below if this kind of conversation is helpful. One of the things I want to do on my channel is bring on scholars as they have new books that come out. For example, in the fall, J.P. Moreland has this massive book coming out in Substance Dualism. We're going to have a 90-minute, two-hour conversation mm. posted on Monday come back Friday and take some of the best questions live together. I've done this a few times, but if this is helpful on my channel and you want me to do this in topics that relate to apologetics and worldview, comment down below if that's helpful. Uh, tons more coming up. Make sure you hit subscribe. This is a topic I come back to because I keep getting a lot of questions, but have a video coming up live on the evidence for Jericho. You're not going to want to miss that one. Have a seventh generation Mormon who left the church going to be talking with him about his story. Make sure you hit subscribe. And if you thought about studying apologetics in depth, this fall I'm teaching a class on biblical sexuality. So we're going to do it Preston and I did, but not over about three hours, over probably 10 hours. And Caleb Kaltenbach is going to come be a part-time uh, speaker and teacher in that class as well. If you sign up quickly, you could join me this fall and even do it by distance. So we'd love to have you. would love to train you in apologetics. Or if you're like, I want to go a little deeper, but not ready for that. We actually have a certificate program and we will walk you through great lectures, just some basic assignments to become an apologist. And there's a huge discount code below. Preston, mm -hmm. hang on one minute afterwards if you can. This has been a lot of fun. Uh, thanks to everybody. Now, I'm not going to be live for about a month. I have some upcoming videos I'm going to be posting, but I'm taking my wife or the two of us are going together overseas for a couple weeks to get a little break. But when we hit the fall run and got some stuff, I'm super pumped about. We are up in our game here at the channel trying to respond in ways that you want us to. So I'm excited where things are headed. Thanks for joining us today. Uh, and thanks for being on, Preston. Always fun, buddy. Thanks for having me on.